people who really uh, who, who really uh, know your work. Um, historical fiction has always been um, uh, a passion of, of mine. Um, it's such a it's such a great way to, 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 to cover themes um, and to uh, to put color uh, and and nuance uh, on uh, on history, um, so that you're not just trying to learn dates and places, and you're not just trying to learn uh, the roles and decisions of you know so-called great people, uh, but but rather the lives of, of real people wrapped up in, in, in historical moments. Um, so um, with that, uh, let me just uh, take a minute to talk to you about a couple of our upcoming programs. Uh, so we have uh, three more programs in the next several weeks uh, here in this room, uh, our sort of more informal setting. Um, next, uh, next week we have a, a program about the connection between um, ancient languages uh, and uh, the modern world, uh, which I think should be <coughs> uh, should be very interesting, uh, a little bit different uh, than some of our normal kind of geopolitical subjects, um, but something I think uh, should be of great interest. Um, a little bit later this month, we have a program uh, on uh, India and India's emergence uh, as a world power, both uh, politically and economically, um, something that I think uh, more Americans should spend a lot more time thinking about and learning about. It's going to be uh, one of the great important events of, 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 the, of the century. Um, and, um, and then uh, early in April, April 4th, we have a, a program uh, about uh, demographic uh, changes in Europe, both internal changes and changes uh, from uh, the uh, surge in migration into Europe, uh, which is, uh, again, issues that uh, don't receive a lot, of, uh, a lot of coverage in the press, but should be uh, interesting to discuss. And then, of course, we have our, our biggest uh, program of the spring uh, coming up uh, a couple weeks, uh, March 27th. Uh, very pleased to, to present uh, Secretary John Kerry uh, at Villanova University. Uh, Secretary is going to give us uh, his uh, reflections on uh, what's going on in the world, um, and we are told, uh, we've been told repeatedly by his staff, offer an optimistic uh, vision uh, of diplomacy uh, going going forward in, in world affairs. So it should be a great, uh, uh, really a great opportunity to hear from him, not only about current events, but uh, I'll have the opportunity to do an interview with him uh, for the audience, and, and I really want to go back through his career uh, and have him reflect on uh, his uh, 40 years at this point, almost 50 years, of public life. Uh, he's been uh, present at the creation of, of sort of uh, every phase of, of uh, modern American life since the Vietnam War. Um, and we're going to ask him to kind of talk, uh, talk through some of his recollections that he had. So I'd like to have you at any or all of those programs. Um, and then um, Kelly is hard at work and planning more. So, so you'll be, uh, watch, your, watch your email and our, and our website. Um, okay, with that, please take it away. Great. <laughs> thank you so much for having Absolutely. me, and Haley, thank you for organizing this, and thank you for, for coming. I was able to meet, I think, I think most of you. I, I'm Ruta Sapetis. Hi, how are you? No. Sorry I'm late, but nice to meet you. No, I'm so happy you're here. Yeah. Thank uh, you. I'm Miss Sargent. I'm on the, on the board working with Craig. And thank others. you. And, and whatever Craig just said is very true. They're all pretty <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. And some of you know me, and, and some of you don't know me at all. I'm Ruta Sepetis. I'm an author of historical fiction. I've written three novels. Um, I have always been a storyteller, but I haven't always been an author. Um, I wrote my first book in third grade. It was an epic failure. <laughs> it was called The Adventures of Betsy. And uh, it became a banned book in third grade. <laughs> That's and, a success. Well, now I see it that way. But when you're, you know, what child wants to be the center of an enduring drama in school? And kids were coming to school with t-shirts that said, free Betsy. They were arguing with their parents. And it stole my courage. And I didn't write another book for over 20 some odd years. And instead, I went into the music business. And I was telling stories through song. I was managing um, the careers of some unsavory rock bands and musicians and songwriters. Um, but it was really a great learning process. I mean, a song is a three-minute story. And I was constantly asking these musicians, what's the story? What's the story? I was working on music TV shows and in video games and really trying to distill story. And one day, one of these musicians turned to me and said, okay, Sepetis, 20 years, 
what's the story? They said, we want to know, what's your story? And I said, oh, my story, I'm Lithuanian. And the lead singer of the band said, I'm so sorry, how long have you had that? <laughs> and I said, no, AJ, Lithuanian isn't an illness. <laughs> Lithuania is a country. And he said, I don't think I've ever seen Lithuania on the map. And to his point, as you know, for 50 years, Lithuania was not on a map. Right. The atlases in some of the schools that I still visit mm -hmm. still say Soviet Union. And he, it was this snarky rock star that said, really, so you're Lithuanian, that's your story. He said, I don't even understand what that means. What does it mean to be Lithuanian? And that single question started, it was like pulling that thread and started this whole new journey for me. Um, I, I went to Lithuania to meet with my father's um, relatives. My father fled from Lithuania when he was four years old. Uh, in 1940, when the Soviets occupied, my grandfather was a high-ranking military officer and was not on the list for deportation, was on the list for execution. And there was a knock at the door. It was my grandfather's friend. And he said, I owe you a favor. And this is your favor. You, you know, you need to leave now. And my father was a little boy. He didn't know what was happening. And my grandparents said, we're going on a little trip. You can take two things. So my father was an artist. So he took his pens and pencils. And he loved soccer. So he took his soccer ball. And as he was running from the house, he said to my grandparents, when are we coming back? And they said, soon, run. And my father never saw his house again. Um, he spent nine years in displaced persons camps, which um, for the Lithuanians here, I think we probably share relatives that live this. Um, and when the Soviets came looking for my father's family and couldn't find them, they arrested and deported 12 of our family members to Siberia. And two of them survived. And in school, I studied, I, I studied Hitler and the Holocaust, as Jordan and I were talking about. I did not study Stalin, and I did not study uh, the deportations to Siberia. So here I am, working in the music business. Understand, I am the most unlikely candidate at this point to become a historical novelist. But I decided that I wanted to write a book. And the idea came pretty quickly. It was one girl, her dream of freedom, and a voice to speak for these people who never had a chance to tell their story. Um, and when I told people, as I was talking about that, I said, oh, I'm, I'm writing a book. It's about a Lithuanian girl deported to Siberia. It's a book for kids. People said, yeah, good luck with that. Um, even my own father, well, my father, his first reaction was, I don't know how I feel about that. That could be frightening. That could be dangerous. I don't, I don't think we're ready for that yet. And he said, and I don't think that young people are, are interested in this story. And that's what I wanted to discuss a little bit here today, um, how historical fiction can be, can create a path for global dialogue. And in many ways, our best ambassadors are these young, these young students. Um, you know, as an author, you write a book, and you think you know what your book is about, because you wrote it. And then you go on tour, and the readers, they tell you what your book is about. And in the United States, my first book, uh, Between Shades of Grey, I am published as a crossover author. So my books are shelved in the adult section and also in the teen student section. Um, and it's not like that in all the countries. The, the book is published in 53 countries and 37 languages, which is no credit to me. That is all the translators who are heroes. But in many of the countries, I'm published as an adult author. They feel the themes are too dark, they're too sad. Um, in Italy, I'm published as a romance author. Deportations to a gulag, but I'm a romance <laughs> author. Um, and so in the United States, the curriculum around my books is courage and survival. That's what the American students are studying, all the educational plans are courage and survival. So when I went to France and I met with my French publisher, they said, let's talk about your writing. And I said, this book is about courage and survival. And they said, no, it's not. They said, Ruta, in France, this book is about identity. Through the Lithuanian history, you know, we, we, we wonder how much can be taken from a human being before we lose our identity. Is it possible to lose our identity? So then I hopped to Spain and I said to my Spanish publisher, this is a book about courage and survival and identity. <laughs> and they said, who told you that? 
I said, oh, my, my, my American publisher and my French publisher. They said, no, Rita. They said, we use the story of Lithuania uh, and, and juxtapose it against the Spanish Civil War, and we use it to study patriotism. Mm -hmm. And this continues. In Germany, the book is about historic responsibility. The German students say, wait a minute. We are taking responsibility for our history. And in the States, you were allied with the Soviets. What's your historic responsibility here? Um, some of the things that happened in Lithuania, you know, during the Holocaust, what is your responsibility? So in Germany, it's a book about historical responsibility. And then when I did get to Italy, I said, oh, Elisabetta, what's the book about? She said, ah, Uta, it's about love, it's Italy. <laughs> so, I, I, which is so funny. And I wanted to show you, see if this will, oh, there we go. So you can see the different covers. Uh, I just brought a few. But the book is published in, in 53 countries, and the countries have different covers, they have different titles, and, and the discussions are so different relative to each country that I go to. And what this has taught me is that you know a book belongs to the reader, and what's important is the reader's interpretation, not the author's explanation of it. Um, and for example, in Germany, on the lower left, the book is called The Invincible Summer Inside of Me. Um, in Dutch, it's called Shadow Love. I mean, this is the, you know, how, how drastically different. But I am so inspired that this story of the Baltics, of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, that people are finding these themes of hope and hardship and love amidst loss. And that means so much to me. And, and the recent publications that I'm very excited about. This is from Ukraine and the country of, of Georgia. And the book is not yet published in Russia. My publisher in Israel is interested in potentially doing a Russian edition of it, which I think would be you know, fantastic. Um, and then there's also a, a group in Russia called Memorial. Um, and there is a discussion that perhaps we would license them the rights to the book for one dollar, <laughs> and they would create uh, a translation of it and you know and, and publish it there. And so, first of all, the book was quite hard to sell. Again, when when I, you're up against um, you know teen novels about vampires, and here you come peddling you know totalitarianism, um, you know that that's it's quite a hard sell. But I was very fortunate to find this small publisher, this division of Penguin, who said they were interested in world books and world stories. Um, and for some of you, uh, I'm sure some of you are writers. And um, uh, I sold world rights to Penguin because never in a million years did I imagine that this would be able to you know, sell in so many countries. But I'm so happy that I did because Penguin has a tremendous network. Penguin spent two years preparing their sales team before they released Between Shades of Grey. They had lunch and learn seminars to, to orient the sales staff about Lithuania, about this history, um, and how were we going to present these stories to young people. And you know, one thing I've learned through writing historical fiction, it truly has taught me that progress is possible. As Craig and I discussed, progress is not permanent, unfortunately. Um, freedom is fragile, and, and so I think this is now um, just a, a crusade for me. After I published Between Shades of Grey, my publisher called me and said, this music business stuff, you know, we, we want you to quit that. Well, I, you know, it was my, my livelihood, <laughs> um, and this was my career for 22 years, and so I had to make a decision. Uh, and I made the difficult decision, which we can discuss later why I made that decision and how I made it. Uh, that decision. But one thing that writing historical fiction has taught me is that through a paradigm of story, we truly can facilitate dialogue. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, my own father, who fled from Lithuania and who is you know, still very healthy, golfed 18 holes today <laughs> in his 80s, um, in his neighborhood, in my father's neighborhood, uh, one day a boy came to his mailbox and said, are you really unpatriotic? My father said, what are you talking about, Jack? He said, everyone says you're unpatriotic. My dad called me. He said, you know, there's a word on the street <laughs> in the neighborhood is that I'm not patriotic. And this was very difficult for my father because he 
loves this country. He is so grateful. He spent nine years in, in DP camps before he was able to come to this country. And, um, and so I asked one of the neighbors, and I said, Shelly, what's this you know, unpatriotic narrative about my dad? Ooh. She said, well, over 4th of July, you know, we get together for the neighborhood fireworks and he won't come. And so they say, oh, that old man is unpatriotic. <laughs> and I went to my father and I said, Dad, knowledge of story helps communities, helps companies, helps countries function better. What they didn't know is that my father, as a child during the war, was bombed in these DP camps. And so the, you know, the concussion bombs on 4th of July, they trigger something that's uncontrollable in him. And he's of a generation where he doesn't just spill his entire story, and he's embarrassed of the trauma that it creates in him, so he just didn't say anything. When he shared his story with Jack, who came back, he said, Jack, you know, I was thinking about what you were saying, and you, I'm going to share a story with you. The entire alchemy of the neighborhood changed. Did you hear Mr. Mr. George was bombed? I mean, the kids, their parents, the sensitivity that they had. And I truly believe that that is our nature, that human nature is to, is to be understanding. But we're very, you know, we, we don't have a lot of time. And so when we hear that someone maybe thinks differently than us, you know, maybe we, we, we're quick to, to judge. Another example of story, I was asked to um, give a presentation on my first book at European Parliament. And I said, this is European Parliament. <laughs> they know about Lithuanians who were deported to Siberia. They said, please come and share your story. And so with a Parliament representative from Latvia and one from Estonia, we shared. And after you know the 30 minutes, uh, a Parliament member from Greece raised his hand and said, I'll be honest, I didn't know this story. I did not know about Lithuanians who were deported to Siberia. And he said, I'm also going to admit something else. He said, sometimes the Greek members of parliament, we make fun of the Lithuanians. And there was this big gas. <laughs> and he said, hear me out. He said, every time we go to session, the conversation is, well, what, what are we going to discuss today? And someone will say, well, we know the Lithuanians are going to discuss energy independence. And there's a big joke. Energy independence, energy independence. He's like, my gosh, with the Lithuanians, it's always energy independence. And this parliament member from Greece turned to the Lithuanian delegation and said, I'm sorry, you don't want to buy your energy from the country that occupied you for 50 years. And he said, I didn't know your story, and I'm sorry. And I'm sitting there, you know, <laughs> thinking, oh my gosh, this is, if, if, if at this level, at parliament, they don't know the story. There is so much work to be done. There is so much progress. And the people who are helping me make this progress are the young readers. They are absolutely amazing. Young readers are full of energy. And they have such a sense of justice. If a young person tells you that they are in love or they are angry, believe them. There was a kid today at the Philly Library who said, love, I have to remember how he said this. He said, love is giving someone the power to destroy you but trusting them not to. These are high stakes for these young people, and they take story very seriously. It affects them. If there's a book that they, they enjoy or that impacts them, it stays with them forever. Think of books that we read when we were 13, 14. They stay with us. And I wanted to show you um, some things that uh, some people are doing, some young people are doing. I'm going to have to sort of skip forward through um, showing some of the covers of my other novels, how different authors <coughs> are interpreting. Um, I mean, very, very different interpretations. You can see, um, you know, in Portugal, it's a romance. In Germany, it's a noir thriller. Of course, in Italy, on the far right, it's, of course, a romance as well. Um, and, and then my, my latest novel, Salt to the Sea, which tells the story of the refugee evacuation through East Prussia at the end of World War II. Uh, the foreign editions are just beginning to, uh, to, to come out. Um, and of course, if there's any Lithuanians here, um, I think I saw Diva with the, with the, the Lithuanian edition. And this is extremely special to me because I am Lithuanian American and I live now in Nashville, Tennessee. Imagine if a Lithuanian who didn't speak English decided they were going to write historical fiction about the Civil War. Tennesseans would say, are you kidding me? Um, 
Yet the Lithuanian people were so gracious in giving me permission. And oftentimes in historical fiction, sometimes even in our own family stories, there are aspects of permission. What right do I have you know, to tell this story? And the Lithuanian, Latvian, and Estonian people, they, they said, please, and they helped to me. Um, and it's the students who are also helping me. So this is in Tarragona, Spain. These, these children, of course, are not Lithuanian. But they decided to do an exhibit after they read Between Shades of Grey, which starts off with a Lithuanian girl who has 15 minutes to pack before she's deported to an unknown location in Siberia. And the kids discussed, if we had 15 minutes to pack and we didn't know where we were going, what do we take with us? So they decided to grab a suitcase and they would each put in the suitcase what they would take with them. And they would take a photo of it and their teacher was so moved that they did this exhibit. And if you look at it on the, the top row, the third from the left, the one student, all she put in her suitcase was her mother. And she said, as I read through this book, I just wanted, I just wanted this girl to have family. And so it's been, that's been so interesting to see. And then, let me see what else. Oh, in, in Sweden, they did an entire stage production um, to explain to their school about um, deportation. Uh, this was in Alabama. This student read the book and was so passionate about it that he decided he was going to teach his buddies about totalitarianism through Lego learning. <laughs> he went to the Lego store and with his own money he bought this and he recreated this deportation scene um, and as a result his friends then read the book. Um, in Massachusetts the kids greeted me in the auditorium when I came for a school visit, dressed in the colors of the Lithuanian flag. Um, and teachers throughout the world are sharing teaching methods for the book. Um, students who are reading the book in different countries, there's an online portal where they can become pen pals. And either students in different countries can like, have a global book club and read and discuss it, or we find pen pals for them in Lithuania. And so some teachers post on on Facebook and Twitter, and this is what my, my students are, are doing, and this is how they're feeling. Um, in the far eastern part of Canada, they did an art exhibit where students um, recreated these scenes, and it became so popular that some of the, the art actually sold for, for you know, very high dollar amounts, and the students decided that they wanted to donate the money to the Museum of Genocide in Vilnius. I mean, and these students aren't Lithuanian. We have now a travel tour. There's a college study tour, a Between Shades of Grey tour um, to Lithuania and Poland. Um, and then we have something else exciting that I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. These students in Denmark, uh, they read the book and they knew that there were some displaced persons camps in Denmark. They actually researched these camps. They looked at the, at the historical photos. They went there. They sent me pictures. Um, in Japan, the book is used at a university level. And so I went to Japan to tour the universities, and I had a duet program with Between Shades of Grey and Unbroken, where we could also look at, at Japanese history. And the professors told me, you cannot do that. They said, in Japan, we do not study our brutality in World War II. Um, culturally, it's very dishonorable. They said, so we're using Between Shades of Grey to study compassionate courage. These Lithuanians teach us that you can be courageous, but you can also be compassionate. Um, and so they created a 125 question exam on the book, and I couldn't answer all the questions. <laughs> um, that's how, how, how deeply they, they, they were going, um, how deeply they, they were going into this, which is absolutely uh, incredible. Some teachers will do a national anthem study. They study the Lith Lithuanian national anthem next to the anthem for Soviet Lithuania. And they allow students to study communism just from the lyrics of these two um, anthems. These are the children in Kentucky that I told you about who actually got to meet Ambassador Pavilonas. They, they read the book and they were passionate and they decided to represent it you know, at their school. Um, and I'm getting pictures from these teachers all the time. Um, uh, kids in in the UK, and if you see at their book club, making Siberian champagne, and and um, oh, these are the kids uh, in Mongolia, and they use it as an all-school read every single year. And then 
in South Africa, in Hilton, South Africa, these girls, um, I Skype with them. I can't go to South Africa, but I Skype with them. And we were able to connect the girls at St. Anne's in Hilton, South Africa, with St. Anne's in Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And now the girls at both schools read the book, and they, they discuss it, and they've had, they have friends, and, um, and they have these book boyfriend contests where, you know, these characters, and it might seem silly, but this is a way that they're, they're understanding and processing this story in a way that it means something to them. And at a school in Tennessee, uh, one of the, the soccer coaches decided, he said, okay, we're going to play this year, but you all have to read a book, and you're all going to read this book. The soccer team, of course they groused about it. They loved the book so much, they went to their coach and they said, we decided, we, we think we should go to Lithuania. And the coach said, you know what, buddy, like, you raise the money, we'll all go to Lithuania. And the boys did. They had fundraisers, and they raised the money, and there they are, in realness. And we partnered them with a school in Kaunas, and they now have an exchange program. And for the past three years, students from Lithuania have been coming, and students from Tennessee have been going. There has been romance, there have been broken hearts. <laughs> you can imagine, this is high drama at, at, at this age. Um, and this is a, a school in, in St. Kitts in the Caribbean who sent me this picture. And this means so much to me because when I was researching to write Between Shades of Grey, and also my other books. Um, the people that I met with, they said, Ruta, don't bother. They said, you have to understand, the world has forgotten us. Lithuania has fallen through the cracks. And I said, no, they haven't forgotten you. They just don't know your story. And that's the power of historical fiction, that through characters and stories, suddenly, a statistic becomes a human being, and for 300 pages we walk beside them, feeling their fear. Um, and so this little picture from St. Kitts was so moving to me. Um, that is the power of books. And every city that invites me, every library, that's the power that they're sharing with me. Um, and as we were discussing, although historical fiction I think is, is certainly important, I think the most important story that you can find and preserve is your own. And I tell these kids, you know, ask your parents, ask your grandparents, what's your story? Share your story. It'll give you a deeper understanding of yourself. It'll give your neighbors, um, your peers, a deeper understanding of you, of the positions that you, that you take so, so fiercely and why, why you feel that way. Um, and I know all of you probably have, have stories, but for me, I think the next step, something I would love to do, um, are actually preserve the real stories that are in Lithuania, in the Museum of Genocide. They have hours and hours and hours of video testimony. And uh, I'm working with a team of translators, and um, I've, I've uh, applied for grants, and we're paying these translators to actually put translations in different languages on these videos. Um, and so that is sort of my, my, my next step, if you will. Um, and, and I'm extremely passionate about it, but I would love to you know, take it from here and, and talk a bit more, more about it with you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, tell, us about the, tell us about the film, uh, the history of that. Is. Yes, the film. Um, you know, many authors that, I mean, I shouldn't, I'm not going to name names, but many of my author friends say, that's my biggest nightmare, is that my work be turned into some movie. I feel the exact opposite. These are not my stories. These are history stories. And if someone is going to take them to a larger audience, oh my gosh, it's my dream come true. And with my first book, um, there were several directors that, with Between Shades of Grey, several directors that were interested. And I, I met with them, and those of you who are Lithuanian will here will understand that uh, when I met with them and they said, I have a great idea, Sandra Bullock is going to be the lead, and it's gonna, you're going to shoot in, um, probably in Colorado, because there's some snow there. <laughs> and I was cringing, and they said, well, you want it to be a big movie. And then I just kept thinking, I want it to be an authentic movie. But I also didn't want to be precious. I didn't want to be one of these, oh, you know. So I was at um, a Lithuanian event in Los Angeles, and the Lithuanian community is a large community like Philadelphia. They're lovely. And a woman came up to me and said, 
my son is a filmmaker. And you know, I don't know what that means. It could be like the boy who's doing Lego learning, you know? I mean, I said, wonderful. And she said, I'm gonna give him your book. And it turned out to be Marius Markavichis, who made the documentary, The Other Dream Team. And uh, he's like my long lost little brother. He called me and his vision, the movie, he said, it's not gonna be a blockbuster. He said, but it's gonna be real and it's gonna be authentic and we're gonna shoot it in Lithuania. And the people, the extras, they will be Lithuanian. We're not gonna have any Americans as the leads um, and everything. And we just decided that we were gonna push this big rock uphill and we were gonna do this together. And no, it's not, you know, it's not gonna be a blockbuster movie, but we have so much support and so much love. And the movie is better than my book. It is better. Even my father, who's close to 90 years old, watched it. He's like, I love you, but this is, this is better. <laughs> um, so I'm very excited about that. I did not write the screenplay. I consider um, novel writing and screenwriting different art forms. And there are many authors who can navigate both beautifully. But because I came from the music industry, I thought that would be a real learning curve for me. <coughs> so Ben York Jones, the Sundance Award winner, uh, wrote the screenplay and we said, well, you can't do it unless you go to Lithuania. So he had to go to Lithuania. The actors who are um, from Finland and Sweden, and they're all from, from shows you'll recognize, like Game of Thrones and Mr. Robot and Vikings, and you'll recognize the faces, but they're not marquee actors. And they were <coughs> so committed. And when we were on set, and I have some, some pictures, maybe I can, uh, oh, it's on, I, forget, I keep forgetting, I keep thinking that I have the, but you know what, I think I, if, if you don't mind, I can right. flip through and find, uh, oh, okay, so here is um, the Hollywood Reporter from the, the con uh, posting. Um, Belle Powley, uh, who is now on, on Broadway, and she was in Diary of a Teenage Girl, and she's in The Bell Jar, um, she plays the, the main character. This is my other film, Salt to the Sea, my third book, entirely different, Universal Pictures with Lorenzo Di Bonaventura, who did The Perfect Storm. It's, it's a much, much different uh, sort of production. But um, here's me and my little brother, Mars. <laughs> you can see how excited I am. And the two actors, um, and this is oh, actually on set in, uh, in Lithuania. And you see the, the little boy who plays Jonas. And here, this is Lisa Lovin, she's in Wonder Woman, and she plays Elena. And Martin Wallstrom, who's uh, the star of Mr. Robot, plays, uh, plays the Soviet guard Kretzky. And Peter Franzen, who's in Vikings, his grandparents were in the Soviet-occupied part of uh, Finland mm -hmm. uh, during this, mm -hmm. and he speaks Russian, and, uh, and, and so con convincingly. And so we have actually, the Soviets are speaking Russian in mm -hmm. the film, and we've subtitled that with English, the Lithuanians are speaking English. So it's been a beautiful process. The elderly people who are extras in the film were children when they were deported to Siberia. And they were helping us in the train car saying, no, 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 this was not like this, it should be like this. And when, when someone who experienced this makes a comment, you listen. <laughs> I don't need to be right, Marius doesn't need to be right, we need to listen. And we've learned so much through this filmmaking, uh, through the filmmaking process. So. <coughs> Fabulous, and when can people see it? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what we're doing um, is, a, as we call it, a, a Lithuanian road show. Uh, we would like to work with the Lithuanian consoles in the various states and host screenings. And that will give us an opportunity. We have a budget, we'll, we'll rent theaters, the actors will come with us and speak about it. Um, the director will come, the screenwriter um, in LA, Ruta Lee, the actress Ruta Lee, who actually, her grandmother was deported to Siberia and she broke her out of Siberia. <laughs> um, you know, she will be there. So we're putting this together. So in the fall, we'll, uh, the premiere in Lithuania is October 12th and then we'll roll it out in the United States in November. Yeah. So we were talking a little bit before some of our guests arrived about the situation in the Baltics today. Um, and you were saying that uh, even with the desire to be in touch with history yeah. and to understand these things, that there is, it's difficult to get young people um, in Lithuania uh, to, to understand this history and to apply it to the, the present moment where there's a you know significant uh, danger 
uh, in terms of the relationship between NATO uh, and, and Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I'm not asking you to, 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 to be a, a policy person, but um, just to, to give us your reflections on uh, the sort of the mood in Lithuania mm -hmm. about communicating, is there an urgency about communicating this history to young people? Um, and what's being done to try to make sure that there is that this awareness is there, so that uh, so that people can apply it to the to the present age. I find, and I would be anxious for um, some of the other Lithuanians in the room to to chime in on this, that the reactions differ by generation. Um, my father thinks everyone should be storing grain, mm -hmm. you know, in, in their basement. Mm -hmm. um, but through the work that I do with the students that we're exchanging now, the students go over and the Lithuanian students then come to their teacher and say, these kids from Dallas, they think the Russians are gonna, could come back into Lithuania, they're crazy. But then we sort of turn the tables and the teachers in Lithuania say, these, these students from other countries are making patriots out of our own kids. And so I find that the mood differs by, by obviously by generation. Um, the older generation, Stalin hangs over them like a cold shadow. Mm -hmm. If any of you have great grandparents that are still um, alive, it, my father, I mean, this is very much real. This is very real. Um, then the younger generation, I mean, Lithuania is, is so incredibly um, advanced in terms of, of the, the entrepreneurial spirit. And just the spirit in general. And of course, I'm horribly biased. Of course, I mean, let's be honest, I'm horribly biased. But, you know, the, the Lithuanians, they, they lost their flag. They lost their families. They lost their country. But they didn't lose their spirit. There is a resilience there in the Baltics. Um, but as a result of making so much progress so quickly, um, there's been this initiative of we don't want to identify ourselves as victims. And now we're free, but is there a danger that exists in forgetting history? Um, is there a danger of just focusing, of a singular focus in history? Lithuania has a wide history. I'm focusing on one lane only, you know? Um, so these things, I, I think the mood is mixed. Um, and it's, I feel just as passionate, maybe even more passionate, that I need to tour the schools in Lithuania mm -hmm. as I do here. Um, and again, I, I don't want to be you know, paranoid and sound like, but this, for me, it's something very real. And, and some of the other Lithuanians, that, what, Daiba, what's, <coughs> what's your perception of this? Uh, I think, as you mentioned, uh, entrepreneurship, and um, it's all driven by us wanting to be independent. It's, I think it's, it's a lot of, brings a lot of success to our country because we want to be independent from any aspect from Russia. And now, you know, our exports to U.S. are much larger than our exports to Russia, which is a progress. We want that. So I think, I think this fear of Russia drives our success. Right. But, but, but I think, you know, myself, I was 19 in 1990. I, I stood at the parliament uh, during January events. I was in the Baltic route where people from Vilnius to Tallinn joined hands and we stepped forward to the West. I was in there, I was like 17 then. So it was all my teenage years when we were rebels and fighting and we are not accepting Russia. And finally we could pull our flags out of deep closets of our grandparents and, and have them risen in, in, in our country. So so I think we have deep rebellion in us. We, we are very kind of we can fight if we have to. So that's the spirit of my generation. It, it's interesting that you mentioned deep rebellion. Um, so my books are published not only in Lithuania, but Latvia and Estonia. But when I meet with the publishers, the initiatives of each country are very different. For example, um, Lithuania published my first book in 2011. And the Estonian Publishers Association came to me and they said, we don't want to disrespect you or the history. But our initiative is that we are not chaining ourselves to the past, and we don't want to identify as victims. So we are waiting, um, and come 2014, we will begin to publish these stories, but not before. So we had to wait until 2014. In Latvia, they told me, oh, well, Lithuanians, 
They're so rebellious. This was just, you know, in a conversation. They're so rebellious, they said, with the Baltic Way. This was their whole thing. We're going to go out. We're going to hold hands. And the Latvians said, oh, my gosh, you're going to get us all killed. What are you doing? You know, so it's interesting. And mind you, I, I'm speaking to groups of people. This is, you know, by no means, uh, you know, it's, it, these are just conversations. But, yes, I think they're... The things that you touch on are absolutely accurate, you know, rebellious and um, very much. Very much. Um, but I think although there is a lot of progress, I try to share with the younger generation that progress isn't permanent. We have to constantly work um, to maintain what, uh, you know, the progress that we've made. Um, and not to get bigger, but to get better to become more understanding, to be able to look through another's eyes and consider their heart. Um, those things are important, too. Questions, comments? I, I want to say this is really fascinating. Thank you. Um, a quick comment and then a question. Yes. In terms of sharing the story, I'm glad you are. It's bringing me back to the days I was in law school in the 1970s, and I was doing research for a professor who was trying to tell the story about Native Americans that were being annihilated in Paraguay uh -huh. and a genocide there, and was trying to get news coverage for it, was trying to tell the story because those Native Americans did not have anyone to tell the story for them. And it was tough because Paraguay was an ally of the U.S. at that time. But, but so I love how you're telling the story. I, I guess the, the couple <coughs> of questions I have is out of curiosity, mm -hmm. you talked about different countries' reactions. I noticed one of the countries, I think, is Israel. Yes. I'm curious what kind of reaction you had in Israel and do you also share the story, the United States has a lot of, well, there are many are dying off now, but a lot of survivors of the Holocaust who were in concentration camps you know, throughout Europe. Do you share the story with them also or go back and forth? Yes, and okay. this is what, when I'm saying that there are, that I am telling a narrow lane of, of Lithuanian uh, history, there is so much Lithuanian history, and as, as we were discussing about, I said, do you ever have events here about the Holocaust in Lithuania? Over 300,000 Jews were killed, and, and just as in other, some other countries, you know, some Lithuanians were, you know, were collaborators here. There's a story there. And so what I've done for educators, because I feel that if teachers are going to use my book, first we can discuss, is there a danger of a fictional account becoming the definitive account, this is not the diary of Anne Frank, which is a gift to, that, that, that is a real story, this is fiction. Um, so what I do with educators is we sit down and I put together companion books, and one that I use is Ellen Cassidy's We Are Here, Memories of the Lithuanian Holocaust. It is not sugar-coated, it is not, and some teachers say, wow, you know, this is, you know, this is pretty heavy, and I say, it is, and it's true, and, and you should go there. I mean, if you're going to, 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 if you really want to study Lithuanian history during this time period, you should study this. So the teachers have been real champions and real heroes coming and bringing ideas, creating um, video companions. And also, let's face it, that I don't think, I shouldn't say any kid, but not many teens are going to run in to their school library and say, quick. I need a book about totalitarianism, or I need a book about a Lithuanian girl starving in Siberia. So these teachers and librarians, they are really I mean, the real heroes. And it breaks my heart what you're telling me about the work that you were doing in the 70s, that perhaps that story still isn't told, because the teachers and librarians, they could really use it. I mean, now more than ever. And that's why when I met with those 400 kids today, I said, I want you to ask your parents and your grandparents, What's our story? You don't have to write a novel. I mean, but maybe there's a way you can preserve this. I mean, what are your thoughts on, you know, on the bigger picture of, of Lithuanian history? I mean, actually, I'm, you're filling me in some of it. I knew about groups of people being deported to Siberia. Mm -hmm. I didn't know all the specifics about Lithuania, per se. Uh -huh. So I, I appreciate that. My, my thought is, I, I'm, once again, glad you're, you're sharing the story. And I think what you're sharing it would be great to share with a lot of other groups. And there's a lot of other groups of people from other parts of the world, including Europe, who suffered a lot you know, during that time period and, and, and have, whether it's concentration camp stories, or there's also uh, Holocaust types of events that have happened in Cambodia or, or in Africa, you know, in Serbia or whatever, in Bosnia, you know, things like that keep going on, sadly. So I think the more that these kinds of stories can be shared, whether it, 
certainly a non-fictional story, but sometimes through a fictional story, I think to a certain extent, it's an ability to kind of reach out even more to different kind of groups, because they're not just focusing on that one group. It, it kind of covers beyond. You're right, that's and that's, that's a flexibility that fiction gives me. Right. For my books, I interview over a hundred people, I mean hundreds of people, and I'm able to weave bits and pieces from various interviews into one character, which I hope then I'm representing a, a, a broader expanse of humanity instead of just telling one family story. The other thing that's difficult for me is some of the things that you're speaking of, they exist. People have written brilliant memoirs, and that's where these translators are truly heroes. If we could have some of these, these stories that you're speaking of translated um, and even put into, let's say, at USC, into the Witness for Humanity program, or um, and I'm, I'm so passionate about it, and I know I'm probably biting off way more than I can chew, but I'm traveling to these different countries, and when I meet these different publishers and translators, I say, hey, uh, you know, if, if I can find a grant, would you be interested in this project? And what is the story from your country that you feel that the world doesn't know? And then they give me a list, you know. So it's, it's you know, small steps, but I feel it's possible. Right. And then real quickly, when I asked about Israel, yeah. what, what was the reaction in Israel to it? Did they have a different theme? Um, um, well, no, no they, they didn't have a different theme, and but the reaction was great. I was, I was invited um, by the uh, Lithuanian ambassador to, to Israel, and unfortunately I wasn't able um, to go, but they've published all of my books. And, and the support has just been, you know, incredible. And that's on my bucket list is to, is, you know, is to go. It's a great bucket list. That's great. <laughs> it is. It's like, you know, yeah, it's on my bucket list, yeah. Other questions or thoughts? Observations? I think one of the things that when I was reading Shades of, um, Between Shades of Grey, I went, you know, to the Museum of Genocide. And, and it's, you know, terrible because again it's so not sugar coated but one like, the thing that stuck with me the most was when they were talking about how in the gulags all the Lithuanians were trying to keep their culture alive and how they would still do the celebrations and you know I, it was you know such a depressing museum to go to but that just really like that like, but it made an stuff. effect on you yeah and that's like I don't like that's like the one image I was like you know when you're speaking about identity, everything's been taken away. They've like cleaned their homes, and then I think at the end of the book, when you were talking about how when they went back to Lithuania, people were living in their houses and taking their names and all that kind of stuff. I just I just keep thinking about how you know even on almost the other side of the globe at that point, they were still trying to keep their traditions and culture alive, and I just like. I don't know, that's like what really affected me the most. It, and that's so important to know because I've had some comments from some of the kids from other countries that have gone to Lithuania after studying the book and they've gone with their teacher on an educational trip. And one comment that they have made to me, to Diva's point, about the economic development, the technological advancement, they said, we would like to see what did an apartment look like during Soviet times? There's, and, and, they, and they said not, we don't want, you know, I know you can go to some countries and it's like a communism tour and they'll, put you, they'll pick you up in a little, you know, car and, and, and yell at you in the car and take it. it nothing like that, but they said they really wonder what did it look like during Soviet times and, and when they go to the, um, the nuclear facility, that makes an impact. The Museum of Genocide makes an impact. And so are we advancing in Lithuania so quickly and leaving that behind that there isn't a, um, even a trace for history, for memory, for, and you know, there's that fragile tension that exists between history and memory. Some people are, are you know, desperate to remember and others are desperate to forget. And in Lithuania, this is the, we do have a statue park. Yes, in Rutas Park. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which was, is very interesting for those of you who aren't familiar. There is a park where they took this, all of the Soviet statues in, in the area and they took them to one park. And it's, I mean, I, I think it's extremely disturbing. Um, so, yeah, but that's the question. There was, you know, so the one museum made an impact on you um, because it was maybe stepping backward. And, mm -hmm. yeah. and for some of us going to that museum, it's like going to our childhood because that's what we grew up with. It's like, 
the, there's an eatery that looks like Soviet times and plates and reminds me of my time in school. So some of us go there just to like remember, oh, okay. To this reminisce. Is how I grew up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was my world as a child. How so frightening is that if you're reminiscing <laughs> at the museum of Genesis? Yes. <laughs> you know? I, I find it fascinating that they, that they moved the statue, Russian statues to one place mm -hmm. as opposed to taking them down. Because we have an issue in this country in some places, some people want to take down right. certain statues. Yeah. Right. So I find it very interesting that they, I guess I don't, they don't want people to totally forget. I think it's almost a way of maybe remembering even more what the Russians made. I don't know. It's remembering, but also, um, and I, I wonder what the Lithuanians who have been there would also say to this, it, it leeches all of the power from those statues when you see them almost, I mean, there is no power left. What, what do you... Is in that swamp. swamp? They're not sitting in a respectful place. It's a swamp where you walk through and they're like peeking through the trees. But a lot of people have, <laughs> have suggested that, uh, have suggest, a lot of people have used that as an example for the debate in the United States about the Civil War memorials. Right. That there is, that, and suggested it as a, as a middle ground between leaving them where they are and destroying them. That 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 if there, there if there is a place in which they can be viewed, right. but not celebrated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean that's sort yeah, of the exactly and, 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 and that's the that's the that's the model. So again, some people have said that. Right. Uh, so I want to come back. Oh, please. Yeah. So um, the question <coughs> is, uh, well, I, I, I'm sort of curious to hear your thoughts and impressions about how you um, reconcile what you wrote in the book with, with a, uh, a political uh, reality here, where I guess it's suggested that some people have uh, embraced an administration that sort of um, supports the Soviets over, or has maybe a possible connection the way I, I look at it, and I'm very interested for your, your commentary on this, is that my books are a door. And they open a door to readers. And the majority of my readers are adult. The readers that I'm working with on a daily basis are these teens and students. Um, and it creates an awareness, and it creates an interest. After they read the book, what the students tell me is that they go online and, and they do their own research. And it's the students who are coming to me and asking those same questions. You know, I have to ask you, how is it, how do you feel about our president if there are these allegations that he, you know, he is working with, with Russia? And it brings up such great conversations. Um, my books are used for community read programs. And my answer to this is really the readers are the ones who are answering these profound questions. At the community read programs, um, it's like an all city read. And middle schools will read it, high schools, universities, adult book clubs, and elderly retirement communities. We all gather in an auditorium and we discuss the book together. And we have Lithuanians sitting next to Russians with Germans, people from Israel, from Poland, Japan, we're all together. And so history divided us, but through reading, somehow all of a sudden we're united in story and study and remembrance. And it's the readers themselves who bring up these topics. So I don't have to, um, I don't, I almost, I, I don't have to take a stand, I don't have to take a side. Um, I can facilitate the, the conversation, but I guess I could say I never anticipated. Well, well, yeah. well, well the question I have is, um, well, well, during the Second War, War uh -huh. where uh, the French at first were opposed to Nazi Germany, uh, but then when they started to lose the war, uh, there were some factions in uh, France that became collaborators. Uh, and some people that were, were still opposed to Nazi Germany. Um, the, um, the factions that were opposed left and they went to Britain uh, to carry on the uh, resistance. While some people in France stayed uh, and they resisted to some extent but there were a significant portion of the French that were openly collaborators. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they formed their own government. So um, 
this book is fiction. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but uh, at least my read on it, or my impression, is that um, you can simply collaborate with uh, the oppressor, or you, you can fight them somehow, you can resist, uh, and uh, sometimes it actually comes back to armed conflict. It, it does, and I would say through the, the history that I studied with Lithuanians, there were Lithuanians who told me that they did collaborate. Of course they were. Then there were Lithuanians who told me that you know their grandfather you know ran into the woods and became a resistance fighter and a freedom fighter. Um, there were people who did nothing at all, who felt that they just let the, the, the tide you know, uh, propel them. And I think there are stories in all of those different experiences because that's human, right? We, we can never predict how we're going to react in one of these situations. We might think we, you know, we know, but we don't. You know, we, we really don't. So yes, I think absolutely all of those stories exist. There were collaborators there, you know, there were resistance fighters, um, and which is probably still true, you know? It's true, true today, yeah. So perhaps I might, I might chime in at this point. I'm one of those consuls that Ruta was talking about <laughs> before, and I was just, I came back from Washington this morning. I spent the past few days meeting with our Minister of Foreign Affairs, all the other consuls in, the, in North America, um, and our defense, um, uh, uh, defense staff. So I can tell you, the news is, is that um, the Baltic presidents, so the president of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, will be meeting with President Trump on April 3rd. So that's scheduled. You, know, you never, things always change in life, so but we're hoping that indeed will happen. And I think I'll, I'll make, uh, if, if I may, two more bits of information Please. that might be helpful. You may have all remembered during the election, Trump was saying, I don't know about NATO. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay, so the issue around that, which is, there is truth in that, that is around the upset, is that many countries who belong to NATO were not keeping their word or the meeting the goal, I'm good talking in generic terms, but they're meeting the goal of committing their, a percentage of their own funds to their defense. So this was the big upset that he was, but a lot of people, he's not, he's not throwing NATO out the window, but he is saying, yes, you have to keep your word. So Lithuania has been increasing its percentage of defense. I mean, for <clears throat> how long it didn't have any defense. So it's increasing its percentage. It is meeting its goal of 2% of gross uh, of GDP given to defense. So this is a big step. The, go ahead, I'm sorry, you look like you're about to ask another question. There's no question oh, okay. to ask, but I think that, uh, at least from my perspective, um, the idea that uh, certain factions within this country would uh, collaborate with the Russians seems obvious to me. And uh, the idea that, they, um, that certain factions within a country even collaborated with Nazi Germany is true too. So uh, it's, it is absolutely distressing. There's no, no, no the, it is. A, it is. A, we're we're all going. What what's going on? We're trying to figure it out. That will segue into another point I'd like to make, if I may. So one of the biggest um, issues in you know with the the defense staff that was there is that is preparing for a possible coming up with the right strategy to protect the Baltic nations, to protect Lithuania. Mm -hmm. You may not, I don't know if you mentioned this, but uh, Lithuania has been paired for 25 years. We're celebrating the anniversary of our partnership with the Pennsylvania National Guard. When the Soviet Union broke apart, 
the ex-Soviet republics were each paired with a different state. Lithuania got paired. I don't really know how they made the decision, to be honest. <laughs> um, we got lucky. We got paired uh, with Lithuania. So a lot of the first Lithuanians who land, who came to America, came via Pennsylvania. So maybe that had, maybe history had some impact. Okay, but what they're working on now is, is it, and why books like Rutas are so critical is because they are fighting, it's, it's a cyber warfare. There is a disinformation. They are twisting, the Soviets, or the Russians, excuse me now, are twisting history. On the um, anniversary, um, is it, Daiva, you can correct me, or Ruta, mm -hmm. is it June 13th or July 13th? June 14th, the deportation? It was when the, so Lithuania was occupied by the Russians, then the Germans, then the Russians again. So when the Russians came in the second time. 44, 1941. Yeah. So it's either June or July, so the 13th, yeah, correct me, 14th, okay? The, the, the Russian embassies around the world tweeted out, today we celebrate the day we freed Lithuania from the Nazis. <laughs> and this went all over, they used the bots, that they, the Twitter bots, to all over the place. So then, well, it's a there is a certain, there, certain point of view. To some extent, it's valid because, you could, you because could, they also fought. But think about Nazi Germany. it's twisting history. The Lithuanians were outraged, <clears> and there <throat> is, if you look up um, Russian trolls, and uh, it might be Lithuanian elves or Baltic elves. <laughs> there's a great story. There's there is an underground movement, just like the partisan movement, you know, to fight the disinformation on a regular constant it, it is constant where they do it's like it's like spin doctors taking yes you're right to a certain extent they did free Lithuania for the Nazi from the from the Nazis but yeah they took over themselves you know they're this we we don't celebrate this holiday <laughs> you, know, you know it's it's not on our calendar um, Krista, we're going to have to leave it there. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here. Obviously, this is a conversation that could go on much, much longer. Um, but uh, uh, Ruta has very uh, graciously agreed to stay, sign some books, $10. It's a great bargain of the century. <laughs> um, so please, if you don't already have a book, get one. If you do have a book, get another one. Um, and and we'll, uh, we'll adjourn this part of the meeting. So thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.